Welcome to Worship with Elliot Unitarian Chapel. Wherever you are tuning in from, near or far, we're so glad you're here. I am Elliot's lead minister, the Reverend Barbara Gaydon, and I hope that this is a service that nurtures your spirit. If you are new to Elliot Chapel, we are an intentional community that welcomes all, all races, genders, all levels of ability and disability, all sexual orientations. We, come, we welcome people of all creeds and beliefs, all economic circumstances, and all types of families. Our vision is to create a just world through vibrant, beloved community. If you would like to connect with us and learn more about our congregation, please look for information at the end of the service. This week, we are proud to welcome to our pulpit a beloved daughter of the church, the Reverend Susan Frederick Gray. Reverend Susan served the UU congregation in Phoenix, Arizona for many years before becoming president of the Unitarian Universalist Association a few years ago. And as part of her powerful and pastoral leadership during this pandemic, she and other UU ministers have come together and created a special worship service and offered it to congregations to help us do the work of stewardship in this year. She reminds us that we are not alone. Our congregation is not alone. So we're sharing parts of the service with you all today and adding a few elements of our own. We also welcome the Reverend Mariela Perez Simons as she shares a reading and her own reflection with us. And I asked Reverend Susan if she might also share a greeting, especially for Elliot Chapel. Here it is. Hello, family of Elliott Chapel. I am delighted to bring a very, just a special personal greeting to all of you on this as part of this national stewardship service. You all are my home congregation, uh, the community that helped along with my parents form me and raise me. And I am eternally grateful to all of you and to everyone who has been a part of the Elliott community, leaders, members, religious education teachers, staff, and ministers. You all show up, you'll see, you all show up prominently in my sermon uh, to the wider association about the life-saving, life-changing ministry that I experienced at Elliott and that I know that so many people experience from Elliot and our wider association. I am so proud of your ministry. I'm so grateful to your minister, Reverend Barbara Gaydon, to all of your staff and leaders, and to the youth who've come out of Elliot Chapel and done so much, provided so much leadership to the wider association, but also in their communities and the ways they experience their calling. You all, as the community of Elliot Chapel, deeply shaped my calling my understanding of who I am. It's because of the warmth and the love and the life-saving ministry that I experienced at Elliott Chapel that I followed this call to give my leadership to Unitarian Universalism and why I believe so powerfully in the importance of our communities as places of love and justice, as places that not only practice inside our walls, but bring forth a vision for our larger community of what it means to demand the worth and dignity of every people to work um, for the worth and dignity of all people to be recognized, to offer a vision for human community that is rooted in justice, compassion, and equity, and a practice of a theology that understands that none of us are isolated beings that we are woven and interconnected. That our well-being, the well-being of any of us, is dependent and connected to the well-being of all of us. Thank you for the ways that you have shaped my ministry. I will never be able to give back all that I received. I look forward to that day when I get to come to St. Louis and visit you all and see you in person. I know that day will be here one, 
someday, uh, hopefully not too far in the future. May you continue to give generously to your religious community, that it may continue to be a beacon of love and justice in the wider community and a life-saving community for all who are a part of it and who are yet to come. I send you my love and my blessings on this day. On the day we are together again. On the day we are together again. I will pull you in close like a hoop with no end. On the day we are together again. We will share the same table again. We will share the same table again. I will pass you the salt, the candlelight will bend. When we at the same table again. We will walk round the block hand in hand. We will walk round the block hand in hand. We will stop for a snack at the taco truck stand. 
like a hoop with no end. On the day we are together again. People have to dream a church into being. They have to have a vision for what could be and allow themselves to want it. We come today grateful for those dreamers. People have to labor for a dream to become a church. They have to meet and plan and find agreement. They have to make calls and write letters, teach Sunday school, warm up, warm up food, work in the yard and raise the money for their dream. We come today grateful for those laborers. People must love a church into being. When they get weary, when resources seem scarce, when they can't seem to agree, they must love enough to see it through, to see in one another the hope and the salvation of the world. We come today grateful for all who have loved this church into what and who we are now. And now we are those people. It's our blessing. It is our honor. And it is our turn. Come, let us worship. We light this chalice as a beacon of hope. A source, a source of, of light, light and, and wisdom. A symbol of compassion and commitment. And a sign of our abundance. I'm joining you here from First Parish in Cambridge, and I want to thank the First Parish community and Reverend Adam Lawrence Dyer for offering their space to us. First Parish sits on the occupied land of the Massachusetts people. A community of the Massachusetts people still live in Massachusetts in the community of Canton. I have a story for you today. And there's two things that are important about this story. Number one, it's a true story. And number two, it's an anonymous story. So I read this story many years ago in Yes! Magazine. And the author of the story was listed only as Jane B. I love this story because it speaks to the fact that even in incredibly difficult circumstances, that the presence of love, that acts of generosity and hospitality really are life-saving. Here's Jane's story. Jane and her brother grew up 
in the 1940s in Hollywood, California, a town known for show business. Now, Jane says that she and her brother were adopted by their parents, not because their parents loved children, but because their parents thought it completed the image of the perfect Hollywood family, a beautiful home in Beverly Hills, a fleet of servants, two adorable children, and a little spaniel dog. Jane and her brother hardly ever saw their parents. They were largely raised by the housekeepers and nannies. It was only on Sunday when the whole family went to the country club. There, Jane and her brother were expected to be perfectly well-behaved, not to run around or get dirty, to know which piece of silverware to use at every course, to be seen but not heard. They were taught to speak only when spoken to. Looking back, Jane said of herself, I wasn't a real girl. I was a cardboard cutout of a girl. Jane's best memories from her childhood were when she was with her grandmother. And one day, her grandmother took her to a rummage sale in a church basement. Now, this was Hollywood, California. So this rummage sale was filled with costumes and fancy clothes that were from the movies or from movie stars. Jane's grandmother gave her $2, which was a lot of money at that time, and said, buy whatever you want. Well, Jane went home with two armfuls of things. And as soon as she got home, she ran straight up to her room with all of that loot. And she started trying things on. Finally, she settled on a little pink night dress, a big broad hat, white satin gloves, and every piece of costume jewelry that she bought. She looked at herself in the mirror and Jane was awestruck. She looked like a different person she decided to give herself a new name, Madame Modifus. Now, whereas Jane was quiet, Madame Modifus was bold. And whereas Jane was shy, Madame Modifus was flamboyant. And whereas Jane always did exactly as she was told, well, Madame Modifus, she had a mind of her own. Jane, all dressed up, ran down the stairs across the yard to the house next door and knocked on the door. When the mother next door and her little son opened the door, their jaws fell open. Jane said, my name is Madame Modifus. May I come in for tea? Well, the mother and her son, they welcomed Jane into their home. They played for hours and then Jane went back to her house. Now, any time that Jane had a little bit of time to herself, she would get all dressed up and she would run to the neighbor's house and they just came to call her Madame Modifus. Jane ends her story by sharing how she now is a grandmother and that one of her favorite things to do is to visit her own grandchildren and that whenever she goes to see them they wait for her outside on the yard and when she pulls into the driveway they jump up and down and scream her name Madi, 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 the only name they've ever known her by. I invite you now into a time of prayer and meditation. Take this moment if you would to breathe deeply. And notice, if you would, where the breath is in your body, where it is the most apparent. Do you feel it softly outside of your nostrils as it leaves or outside of your lips? Do you feel it in your chest? Do you feel it as your whole body kind of expanding and contracting. Take a moment to find your breath. Spirit of life, we gather in times of great peril for so many. The virus continues mutating and felling more people, even with the vaccine, so many have no access. 
In our country alone, 10 million have lost their jobs, many black and brown, and most not to return to them. In Texas and everywhere, we feel the impact of climate change. It upends us and we worry about what will be. Spirit of life, holy breath of courage and power fill us now. Fill us with the conviction that our faith can transform and save lives and we have sacred holy work to do. Remind us that communities need our highest aspirations and ideals as a living faith tradition. Remind us that the world needs us, even our broken, imperfect, and sometimes messy selves. All are necessary, all are needed. Spirit of life, sacred breath, May we find in this company, even now, even at a distance, may we find a presence, a connection that saves us, that saves the world. And may we find here life and life abundant. May we each in turn know how precious we are and how much our gifts matter to this community, and to the world. Amen. I would like to begin by acknowledging that I live in the traditional land of the people of the three fires. I am deeply honored and grateful to the land itself and to the people who have taken care of it for generations. And today I bring to you a quote from the process theologian Bernard Loomer, who says, by size, by size, I mean the stature of a person's soul. I mean the range and depth of your love, your capacity for relationships. I mean the volume of life you can take into your own being and still maintain your integrity and individuality. The intensity and variety of outlook you can entertain in the unity of your being without feeling defensive or insecure. I mean the strength of your spirit to encourage others to become freer in the development of their diversity and their uniqueness. I mean the power to sustain more complex and enriching tensions. I mean the magnanimity of concern to provide conditions that enable others to increase in stature. End of quote. Of the hundreds of books I had to read for seminary, of the thousands of passages that I read and highlighted and marked, this one has stayed me, with me the most. From the moment I read that quote, I was like, that is it. That is it. Because since I came from Cuba in 1995, I have been in many liberal religious circles, and we had been having in those circles this amazing conversation about what was out there, amazing conversations about the meaning of life, but no one was talking about what goes on in here at the core of our being. No one was talking about our humanity and the struggles that come with being human, as well as the delights. This quote, this quote was talking about these tensions inside of us, the expansion, the volume, the range, the depth, the complexities of our humanity. Shall I read that quote again? Let's read it again. Here it is, by size, I mean the stature of a person's soul, the range and depth of your love, your capacity for relationships. I mean the volume of life you can take into your own being and still maintain your integrity and individuality. The intensity and variety of outlook you can entertain in the unity of your own being without feeling defensive or insecure. I mean the strength of your spirit 
to encourage others to become freer in the development of their diversity and their uniqueness. I mean the power to sustain more complex and enriching tensions. I mean the magnanimity of concern to provide conditions that enable others to increase in stature. Here's another reason why I love that quote so much, why it resonated with me so much. It's particularly this line, I mean the strength of your spirit to encourage others to become freer in the development of their diversity and uniqueness. I was like, what if that is the future of liberal religion? What if this is where we have failed by not encouraging others to become freer in the development of their own diversity and their uniqueness? The story of Madame Modifus is a story that is painfully familiar to me. Someone who came from another country, from another culture, and having to tone it down in order to fit in because my whole self was not, is not welcomed in some places. And what I know about the human soul is that it goes into hiding. It goes into hiding when we can be our full selves, our whole self. And that breaks my heart every single day, seeing what oppression and repression does to the human soul, to our core, to what is most authentic, most unique, most precious about us. What having to repress our life force does to our psyches. I know, I know. And so this quote is asking us to grow the size of our soul, to expand, to open up and let in more perspectives and more languages and more cultures and more colors, more diverse wisdom. And to wrestle, to wrestle with how that contradicts our own worldview. It is asking us not just to allow others their uniqueness, but to invest in the growth of others. That's my second favorite line. I mean the magnanimity of concern to provide conditions that enable others to increase in stature. And that is love, beloveds. That is love. That is love. That investment in creating the right conditions for all of us to grow and flourish. And you know what Zora Neale Hurston said about that, right? She said, love make your soul crawl out from its hiding place. Love make your soul crawl out from its hiding place. May we create more loving conditions. May we invest in love. May it be so. May it be so. Amen. Anashe. One of the ways that we at Elliott Unitarian Chapel honor our commitment to building beloved community is that we give away half of our offering every Sunday to organizations in the community that manifest our values. Um, we are very proud of this tradition. And in the month of March, we are dedicating our offertory to the Great Rivers Environmental Law Center. And I'm so pleased to have the staff at Great Rivers join me and talk about what makes Great Rivers so special. Since 2002, the center has worked to protect the environment and the public health of Missouri and Southern Illinois. No other, no other firm like that here in the state. And our impact is seen through cleaner air and water, protected parks and wild lines, increased investments in renewable energy, and seats at the table for citizen voices, and all of that for free. I really enjoy working at Great Rivers for the fact that we're able to support, provide kind of a unique service to a lot of other environmental nonprofit organizations through representing them and their and their members' interests before the court. Um, I sought out Great Rivers actually as a legal intern um, back in 2018. And what drove me to Great Rivers is their environmental justice program. And I've always wanted to work with an environmental justice organization, especially one that is community-based and actually connects with um, community groups. That's not always the case in some larger environmental organization. So I just always has been admired how Great Rivers really engages with the community, especially on environmental justice matters. What's exciting about working for Great Rivers is 
that concept that you learn anytime you learn about environment, um, the, the tragedy of the commons, that uh, there's no one really has an incentive to speak up for the environment. And that's what we do. We speak up on behalf of the environment and those interests that would ordinarily go unrepresented. To me, it's a dream job to be able to work, do public interest work like this. Well, the work wouldn't happen without Elliot Chapel. Uh, citizen support makes all of our work possible. Last year, citizen don uh, donations were 90% of our funding. We, we just wouldn't be doing this work for anybody without support from Elliot Chapel and others. That Lewis Green, who lived one street over from Elliott Chapel on Jefferson, um, he was one of the founding members of Elliott Chapel, and he is was our founding member of our organization. Thanks, thanks again, Elliott Chapel and all for thinking of us in March, and at other times too. We sure, we sure appreciate it. Our goal for the month of March is to raise a total of thirteen hundred dollars. Half will go to Great Rivers Environmental Law Center and half will go to support the life-saving ministries of Elliott Unitarian Chapel. Please be as generous as you can. And thank you.
Yes, love is what I need to know my name. These words from the artist Seal capture the meaning of our story today. The story of Jane and her discovery of her full self and her real name, Madi. Jane's story captured my attention the first time I read it. Her words, I wasn't a real girl. I was a cardboard cutout of a girl. They stayed with me. It's clear the trauma and the pain of her home life. And this isn't unique or even uncommon for children, for any of us. So many of us know these experiences in our home lives, in our work lives, or in the stifling cultural conditions of oppression that seek to make us small quiet, invisible, conditions that seek to rob us of our fullness. But then something happens for Jane. Through the love of her grandmother, the generous embrace of the neighbors, and a little bit of imagination, Jane's full self, Madi, finds expression. The freedom she experiences is in moments those moments when she's able to steal away from her house and go to her neighbors. But it is enough. These small moments of joy and love in the midst of the neglect and the suffering, they are life-saving. Zora Neale Hurston writes, love makes your soul crawl out from its hiding place. And that is exactly what Madi's soul does. She is loved into the fullness of her being. I hear echoes of my own story in this story. And maybe you do too. For me, in a time of tremendous difficulty in my life, my UU church was the neighbor's house, full of warmth and welcome music and imagination. And the grandmother? That was my Sunday school teachers, whose love and care, coupled with joy and attention, it made a difference in my life when I most needed it. That congregation, that community, those teachers, they helped me find my voice, my spirit, my soul. They loved me into being. I imagine that you too have stories like this, how Unitarian Universalism, its theology, its people, its ministry changed you, saved your life, helped your soul crawl out of its hiding space, how it helped grow the size of your soul. As process theologian Bernard Loomer so powerfully describes, by size, I mean the stature of a person's soul, the range and depth of your love, your capacity for relationships. I mean the volume of life you can take into your being and still maintain your integrity and individuality. There's so much expansiveness and generosity in Loomer's definition of the size of your soul. And he goes on. He says, I mean the strength of your spirit to encourage others to become freer in the development in their diversity and uniqueness. I mean the magnanimity of concern to provide conditions that enable others to increase in stature. You see, Loomer is not just talking about individual growth and liberation. And this matters to us as Unitarian Universalists because our faith has never been solely about individual spiritual growth. 
As Unitarian Universalists, we understand salvation not as individual, but collective. We recognize the fundamental interconnectedness, interdependence of all life and of humanity. Foundational to the core theological idea of interdependence is that mutuality and responsibility are inherent to who we are as human beings. We are not islands. And our tradition calls us not to individual freedom or transformation alone, but to the liberation and thriving of all people. One of the most important and successful campaigns within Unitarian Universalism over this past year was UU The Vote, a national effort for Unitarian Universalists to partner with local grassroots organizing and voting rights groups on an unprecedented voter engagement, voter registration, and voter turnout effort. It was the first ever effort like this on our part as a larger association, and it was awesome. But here's something you may not know about UU The Vote. When I first shared the idea for UU The Vote at the 2019 General Assembly, I didn't know if it would take hold. I was simply throwing out a seed of a dream, imagining there before thousands of you, congregational delegates at GA, I asked, what if we as UUs helped engage and mobilize one million people to vote in the 2020 election. When I said that, it was scary. It seemed impossible. And in fact, the next time I talked about UU the vote at a local congregation, I reduced the number to half a million. But before we'd even started to create the team and the infrastructure, where when we were still just talking about this idea, congregational leaders, ministers, religious educators, and members were clamoring to volunteer. Financial gifts began coming in, some unsolicited. Folks were ready to say yes, ready to give generously of their time and resources because they knew that our values of justice and compassion that our system of democracy and the literal lives and well-being of our neighbors, of our loved ones, of each other were on the line and on the ballot. Thousands of people volunteered. Thousands of donors came forward from our congregations, many of you. And together we invested tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of hours and well over a million dollars to vote love in the 2020 election. And in the end, we reached well over 3 million potential voters, far exceeding our wildest dreams. In what was the largest most transparent and accessible election in our history, we UUs played a significant role. And we were likely the largest, most organized, faith-based pro-democracy effort during the election. Wow. Imagination, generosity, commitment, collective action. These fueled UU the vote. But there was also some magic to it because it recognized our strengths and it invited us more fully into who we are. For we are the people who show up. We are the people who work together in community. We are people who believe in democracy, who understand our faith as active, who are concerned about the conditions of justice here and now, and who, when it comes right down to it, are a hopeful people. We are a hopeful people about what is possible and about our agency and capacity to meet the challenges of our time. 
Some of the magic of you, you, the vote was that together we were loving each other into the fullness of who we are as Unitarian Universalists. But this isn't the end of the story. It is a reminder. It is a glimpse of what is possible when we say yes when we say yes so generously and powerfully to what we believe in, to what we care about, to our ministries, our values, and when we choose solidarity, interdependence with wider networks of people working for justice, compassion, and liberation. From the beginning of my time as UUA president, I have said this is no time for a casual faith. No time for a casual commitment to what you love most. And this is no time to go it alone. You, you, the vote is just one example of what it looks like to take our faith, our values, and our commitment to interdependence seriously. It is life-saving, life-changing ministry individually in our own lives and revolutionary when we bring that powerful yes out into the world. And this yes, this yes is what is needed so deeply in our communities and our world right now. To love our society, to love our world into a new place of being. In her important book, Cast, Isabel Wilkerson explores the conditions of racism, white supremacy, and racial hierarchy as an American caste system. And in her book, she quotes Gary Michael Tartikoff, an American scholar of castes, who says of the United States, this is a civilization searching for its humanity. It dehumanized others in order to build its civilization, and now it needs to find its own. There's power in those words and that history. So how do we find our humanity as a society, as a country, as a civilization? The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King said the key was love. By love, King did not mean a sentimental or romantic kind of love, but rather an overflowing, audacious, and unconditional love that sought the fullest unfolding of every person. King said this love might well be the salvation of our civilization. The only way that we overcome the forces of racism, domination, discrimination, dehumanization, the forces that are at the foundation of the United States, those forces that have the effect of dehumanizing our society, the only way we overcome those forces is to turn to the deepest source of our humanity. And as Unitarian Universalists, we know that that foundation, that source of our humanity is our compassion and our interdependence, our mutuality and relationship and responsibility to each other. In other words, I would take Bernard Loomer's words and King's words and say, we need to grow the size of our love. And by size, as Loomer says, I mean the range and depth of your love, your capacity for relationships. I mean the volume of life you can take into your being. I mean the strength of your spirit to encourage others to become freer, to provide conditions that enable others to increase their stature, the size of their love and their soul. And this is where the real spiritual depth and calling of our faith lives, not just as an intellectual exercise, but as embodiment. 
embodying and growing our capacity for this powerful form of love that encourages all of us to live into the fullness of our being and that is committed to the conditions that make this fullness possible for everyone. Compassion, interdependence. Looking back, the love of her grandmother, that trip to the church rummage sale, and the generous, inclusive embrace of her neighbors made a powerful difference to young Jane, to Maudie. Looking back, the warmth and magic of my UU church and the love and care of my Sunday school and youth leaders shaped my life and my calling in ways that I will always be grateful for and will never be able to repay. Looking back, you, you, the vote became this incredible source of community, joy, and positive action in the midst of what was one of the most traumatic times in our lives. It drew us together in unprecedented ways and was a lifeline. And this is not the end of the story. It's just a glimpse, just a few stories to capture some of what is possible in all of our congregations when we say yes, when we say yes boldly, audaciously, powerfully to our values, to our spirits and our love, and to one another. These stories and more are happening all across our congregations. None of us, none of us will ever know all the difference that our generosity to our congregations has made to the lives of our children, our families, our elders, to the lives and conditions of our larger communities. We'll never know all the ways that we have helped make a difference. When we give boldly, generously, audaciously of our financial resources as we are able we make our values and our ministry manifest in the world. When we give generously of our hearts and our care and our love to our children and families, elders and adults, young adults and youth, we change lives. We save lives. And when we dream big, as leaders and staff about the impact we are called to make in the wider world, lives are changed. The material conditions of our communities can change. We are changed. We make it possible. Loved into fullness, loved into being. May we keep saying yes boldly, courageously, and lovingly to our values and our faith. May it be so. Hello, I'm Mary Myhouse, and I'm privileged to talk to you today as a co-chair of the 2122 Stewardship Campaign for Elliott Chapel. My co-chair is Miriam Collegeman, and we're grateful to have the participation of the following people on this team. Of course, Reverend Barbara, Ellen Duncan, Steve Harvey, Carolyn Burke, Francis Beecher, and Janelle Berger. It's been fun to talk through the meaning of stewardship with this team and work on a plan of action to support our beloved church. The theme of stewardship this year is open doors to lasting abundance because that's how we feel about Elliot. If you're like us, you can't wait until the doors of Elliot are open once again and we're able to celebrate in person. Meanwhile, the church doors are locked, but church has remained alive and vibrant. It's painful. It feels lonely sometimes. It just doesn't seem right. But we have faced these challenging circumstances and kept church going in our homes, in our hearts, and in our minds. Church has been happening behind the doors of our homes instead of behind the doors of 100 South Taylor. We have let each other in by interacting through Zoom gatherings, Zoom meetings, phone calls, emails, and video recordings like this. 
The offices of Elliot have moved behind the doors of their homes, the ministers, the staff, the wonderful, hardworking staff. Their roles have continued and expanded and stretched to meet the different demands that virtual church requires. Having an empty church building has some advantages. There's been much needed building improvements going on in our absence. Myron has been very busy. Stewardship is the time of the church year when we reconnect and recommit to our financial support of the church community. Our campaign starts today, March 14th, and will run until the culminating celebration event on Saturday, April 10th called Carnival, because we're going to be in our cars when we meet at Merrimax parking lot from 2 to 4 p.m. that Saturday. More details to come. It's going to be fun. The stewardship team this year has the added challenge of how to engage your generosity when we can't meet face to face. We decided to publish a booklet, and this booklet is sharing important information about how vibrant and alive Elliott Chapel is, even though we're not gathering face to face. Please take time to read the mailer that came to you in a packet about a week ago or so. You can also reach all that information by going to the Elliott website and open the web page dedicated to the stewardship campaign. In the booklet, there's a page titled Keeping Church Going in Time of the Lockdown. Thanks to the dedicated efforts of an amazing staff and many volunteers, we've been able to move to fully digital services and Elliot has been able to remain a vital part of our lives. I encourage you to look at that book and look at the technology improvements that were purchased to make this possible. We owe Camille Novak a debt of gratitude for writing not one, but two PPP loan applications to help support the business of our church. Both loans were granted and has helped us keep afloat despite declining pledging units last year. In the stewardship booklet, you'll also see many of the ways that our contributions help keep Elliot going and the astonishing ways that ongoing groups are thriving virtually. We've not lost our mission and purpose. Lasting abundance is achieved when we have a shared sense of mission and purpose, and we've not lost that. This stewardship team doesn't want the culture of generosity at Elliott to create any feelings of anxiety or shame about giving on your part. Giving is one tool that we use to create the world that we want to live in order to build the values that we hold most dear. Giving actualizes our values. What do you value? What do you hold dear? From where does your lasting abundance rise at Elliott Chapel? Is it the social justice efforts, advocating for the poor and the oppressed, helping endangered environment, advocating for victims of unfair immigration laws and systemic racism? Is it through meeting with like-minded friends in the young adult group, the senior high group, Women's Alliance, Friday Free Thinkers? Does your abundance rise from attending or leading meaningful discussions in small groups and ministries such as A Course in Miracles, Attitudinal Healing? Perhaps your abundance actuates itself through outreach programs like Room at the Inn and the Kirk Care Food Drive or perhaps internal programs like spirit and practice groups, the grief group, covenant groups. Maybe you sing in the now virtual choir or you play music for services. Maybe it's listening to the music that's created that fills you with lasting abundance. Whatever it is, the depth of your abundance depends on the depth of your gratitude. I encourage you to seek abundance and give back in amazing ways. Greetings, everybody. I'm Brian Krippner, and on behalf of the Board of Trustees, I want to thank everyone who has helped to keep Elliott Chapel functioning and thriving during this very unusual months. Our community has kept the virtual doors open, and it's on solid footing for a real opening of these doors when it's safe to do so. All of you have helped to keep the chapel vibrant this year through your financial gifts, 
leading or participating in programs and attending virtual Sunday services. It's inspiring that so many of you continue to be very generous with your contributions of time, talent, and treasure. Our annual stewardship renewal or canvas is an important time in the operational cycle of the chapel. Results from the canvas inform Reverend Barbara and the staff of what might be expected in pledges in the coming church year. This allows budgeting of money and other resources to ensure both continued operations and movement toward achieving larger, longer term plans, which we sometimes call ends. A healthy budget encourages us to think about ends and the future in new and exciting ways. So here's my ask. Make a significant contribution. Define significant in a way that makes the most sense for you and your situation, and also recognizes the, important that Eli, the importance that Elliot Chapel has within you, among your friends and family, and beyond our walls, be they real or virtual. Everyone is important and makes a difference. Collectively, we make this possible. I look forward to walking through our big red doors and seeing you all again in person soon. Thank you. Now may the love which overcomes all differences, which heals all wounds, which puts to flight all fears, which reconciles all who are separated, be in us and among us now and always. Go in peace.